Today is uh, our concluding talk in our spring 2022 lecture series, and I welcome all of you, and especially welcome also our distinguished speaker, Barbara Busser, uh, who will give a presentation today. I'm Gabriel Koyar. I'm a professor in practice here at the School of Architecture in the University of Minnesota, and um, has been a pleasure to organize this series and, and host um, wonderful speakers like Barbara uh, today. Um, Barbara Busser is the co-founder, together with Eric Honegger, of Baubüro in situ, an architectural practice established in 1998, focused on the social, contextual, and environmental dimensions of reuse. Busser earned a degree in architecture from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, the ETH, and after two years working in Sudan and Tanzania, established the Bauteil Börse, an exchange for recycled building materials in Basel, Switzerland, which she directed for over 10 years. The work of Baubüro in situ is rooted in four sustainable principles, adaptation, transformation, modularity, and circularity. And the studio's slogan, Wir planen vor Ort, which roughly translates to, we plan on site, reveals how the practice defines its agency mediating between the specificities of a place, its buildings, surrounding residents, and the ideas of developers, the practice operates from the present, but engages with extended timeframes. Appropriating unused and discarded buildings and their components, Baubüro in situ cultivates an ethic of architectural care, emerging from technical knowledge and aesthetic sensibility. In their projects, Busser and her colleagues creatively develop the organizational and logistical factors that allow the anthropogenic building stock to become a useful resource that is socially and ecologically meaningful. Alongside Busser's work in the area of reuse and meanwhile use of buildings, she has also kept, sorry, she has also helped establish institutional structures for urban transformation. These efforts have resulted in, for example, the Denkstadt think tank, which brings together interdisciplinary teams to study and implement the repurposing of rural, rural and urban industrial sites in Switzerland, the Verein Unterdessen, which operationalizes temporary programming on private and public property, and more recently, Circular, a specialist planning firm for circular building processes in the building industry. For these important contributions and achievements, uh, most recently, Busser has been recognized with several important awards, including the Swiss Grand Award for Art in 2020 and the Holson Foundation Global Gold Award in 2021 for the K118 project, a building made from salvaged materials, which we will have the opportunity, opportunity to hear about today. Barbara, thank you so much. Welcome and uh, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thanks for this uh, very kind introduction. It's almost everything was uh, correct, only that I've been working 10 years in Africa, not only two. And Sorry was, about that. Okay. <laughs> don't worry, because I can just take it as a, a start. But, um, I think it's very important to know that the, what I've seen in Africa has led to all what I've been doing since then. Um, but I was responsible at the University of Dar es Salaam for the building maintenance. And I came to realize that there is no waste in Africa because everything which is not used by one person anymore is going to be used by somebody else. And that's when I came back to Switzerland and I saw the waste culture which we are um, having here. I couldn't stand it anymore and it made me start to think about changing things and that's when I found it this uh, exchange of construction material, material which is waste for the ones and a good resource uh, um, for others. So it's 50 years ago we had the, the Club of Rome warning against using too much energy, warning against producing too much CO2. 25 years ago, I started with this foundation of Bauteilbörse Basel, 
and an overall association which is called Verein Bauteilnetz Schweiz. We were about 25 different organizations and the Verein, the association, made a roof overall and tried to establish some standards. Today, instead of reducing the waste, we are producing 17 million tons of construction waste every year in Switzerland. I don't want to calculate how much it is worldwide. And at the same time, the Swiss law prescribes that we would have to reduce our waste. We have to reuse things instead of wasting them. And if that's not possible, to recycle. This can be done on different levels. In the, mean, in the 20 years since this law was issued, Recycling has been developed. I'm, I'm sorry, Barbara. The, I think something might have covered the, the microphone. Okay. How is it now? Now it's good. Okay. Maybe I, it was my hands. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm trying to keep my hands still then. What did you hear? <clears throat> you you heard, heard about the Swiss law that prescribes reduce, reuse, recycle. And recycling has developed into a big industry, but it is an end of pipe solution. Swiss people have become world champions in recycling, but it hasn't made them produce less waste. Reuse is the thing we are fighting for because instead of um, using up all the CO2, which we can spend into the atmosphere, send into the atmosphere, we try to keep the embedded embodied energy and reuse a window as a window and not recycle it and melt the glass and the aluminum again. Reduction on the third level is uh, something very personal. It's very difficult to ask people to reduce. It can be done by laws. It can be done by sheer necessity. If you don't have money anymore to pay for, electricity you are going to reduce but this is not the aim the aim is to reduce to on a on a personal basis and to reuse whatever we can and at the end if there's no other solution to recycle so the reuse and recycling can be done on several levels this is the house where i've been teaching at eth and you see uh, something written on top by my students, netto null by 2030, zero carbon by 2030. This is the aim which we should reach if we don't want to get to the tipping points of the atmosphere, but um, it is very, very difficult. We had today a discussion with the professors of ETH and they have come eventually to the conclusion that something needs to be changed, but nobody really knows what can be changed in a big scale. The students formed an association which is called Countdown 2030. So they do count down the days and the weeks until we should stop producing CO2 until we should, should uh, reduce considerably the emissions caused by the construction industry. By then it was 425 weeks left. Now we are around 300 something. Countdown 2030, it says that we have to work on three different levels. We have to work on the level of urbanism and infrastructure. For example, such a factory which we were able to save from destruction. It's 34,000 square meters of built up um, surface and it can all be perfectly reused. Of course, it has to be refurbished. It has to be isolated the, because we cannot just heat such a volume with very bad windows and things like that and walls. But with the proper refurbishment, we could reuse all these rooms and the nice thing is that all the rooms have a different character. You see the, these, these kind of uh, roofs, then we have the round sheds, we have just normal 
roofs, we have flat roofs and everything. And each room in this factory has a different character and atmosphere. The second level is the level of single buildings. I'll show you an example. This really not very attractive building was uh, rented by the Impact Hub, which is a worldwide association for young startups and innovative companies. And they asked us to transform this building into something which also shows what is the use of it. We tried to open some uh, walls to make more connections. We installed um, places for meeting. We installed a bar. We took out the floor and we left it the way you see it here. We took out the whole double floor to increase the room height. And this has become a, a nice meeting room before the room height was not enough. Here we see again the meeting places for working quietly or making phone calls. And now we come to another building. That, that's uh, where my office is. It's an, also an old factory. And we see these beautiful brick walls and the way they have been refurbished. At night, there's different use of these old buildings. Inside, that's how it looks. And who would build a restaurant with 12 meters room height? Nowadays, nobody can afford it, but if it's there, you can use it. And when there's not enough space, we added two floors to our office because we had too many people and we didn't have enough workspace. So all this is possible within the old building, keeping the old building, keeping even the color. You see this orange color is a flame protection color. And uh, we just left it the way it was given to us by the factory which left the house. And then we come down from the level of whole factories, single buildings, we come down to the level of elements and materials. We can reuse timber, we can reuse insulation, cutoffs, you see this, although it takes more time and though money to fill in these cutoffs into these spaces than if you buy new material, which is easier to cut and you need less uh, personal effort to fill up. Now I'm trying to show you three examples of how we are working. One is in uh, Liesbüchel, Basel. It's a facade of 1000 square meter. The second is the famous K118 in Winterthur, where we built up a whole house of reuse material. And the third is the sort of a result or a mixture of the two, where we were asked to build a unit for offices at the famous EMPA, the Eidgenössische Materialprüfungsanstalt, the Federal uh, uh, Institute for Examining Materials, which is a big honor to be able to build there. So let's start with Lisbüchel. And we go into the middle of the praxis, because as I said, everybody is aware that we have to change things, but very few people know or have tried out how this could be done. We had these two buildings, they were once together and we had to take away one part of the roof and we were standing there with an open facade of a hundred meter long, three floors high. And they told us it's a temporary building, which we want the town council. So we said, okay, if this is temporary, let's make a test. Let's use already resalvaged materials because you don't need it to be there for a hundred years, although it would be without problem. It would have a lifetime of a hundred years. But with this precondition, uh, pre, pre the town council agreed to make a test. 
We were therefore looking for windows, for timber, for isolation material, and for metal sheets to cover the whole thing up. Windows is not an easy thing to reuse because we have to fulfill all the, the measurements, the, the, the laws for insulation. And we decided to make a phone call round within one week. We called all the window uh, builders around and we got, this is the result. After one week phone calls, we were offered all these different windows. Now, what do you do with them? It's not the normal architect's task to make a puzzle of so many different shapes. We tried to do it, we put it together and we found it's not really attractive. And also the owner of the work said, mm, we don't really like it. So we tried with an architectural trick to get it a bit more rhythm and more regulation in it. And we added this green cladding in between the single elements. When we showed this plan to the owner, he agreed and he said, okay, let's go for it. You see the red frames, you see the windows, all this puzzle, and then the green cladding, which gives a rhythm to the whole 100 meter long facade. We then started to construct the elements. They have the size that is still transportable with a lorry on the road, three and a half meters wide, 10 meters long. And we use this frame, wooden frames, where we could adjust for all the different sizes of windows. And we filled the spaces in between with cutoffs of insulation material, which you have seen before. All this work could be done in a hall without rain, with all the proper tools, with good working conditions. And then it was put, oops. Ah, I wanted to show you where this wood came from, for example. This is Switzerland. I hope it's not the same in the US that you dismantle a building like this in perfect shape just because it's time has come or it has to move for another bigger building. But this is what they wanted to throw away and we saved it. Then of course we had different sh shapes of timber, which would be difficult to work with. We cut it and we glue it together on the right side. You see the staples of the new wooden framework. And here it comes now empty, but foreseen for the uh, putting the windows in. And this picture you have seen already. So we go to the next. We then cover the whole elements. We put them on the lorry and we put them up on the facade. Within two weeks, the whole facade of 100 meter long was closed and we could start construction in the in in the inside in the warmth um, with the weather being kept out we then covered this metal we put these metal sheets to give as i said to give it the whole facade a rhythm a character and all, you see that also the metal sheets are not new they have different shades of green and it looks quite okay it doesn't really look like a new building and it isn't either because the whole structure has been there already and it's only a new facade. In the inner courtyard, we left the different windows to be seen. And from the inside, it gives a nice picture like a piece of art. Now you see all the different windows, with timber painted, three, windows, two higher ones, lower ones. And it's a very nice uh, place for sports now. And nobody even realizes that these are different windows. And since they are all new, it was very easy to fulfill all the regulations. 
The second example I want to show you is about this Lagerplatz, this K118. It's a new building basing on the existing. And we were allowed to add three floors. We talked to the owner and proposed that we would make an example and just try and use all 100% salvaged materials. With that, we could salvage all the energy, the embedded energy into which is in the materials. We try to reduce 60% of the CO2 and we really wanted to reduce the tons of waste. Remember I told you it's 17 million tons per year in Switzerland. Ah, I've translated it, but I showed you the wrong picture. Sorry for that. We made a sketch on how this could look like. This one, the red addition. You see still the old building underneath and then the addition, three floors, sort of uh, trying to look, what do we have to look for if we want to use salvage materials? We needed stairs, we needed electrical fittings, we needed radiators, we needed, well, what's that, fences, we needed um, timber and so on and the structure in order to build these three floors on top. We asked the owner one year time to find the items which we needed and half a million Swiss francs, which is about 10% of the construction cost, in order to really save the material. Because when you find something which you can use, you have to test it, you have to dismantle it, you have to clean it and you have to store it until you have everything ready and you can start really the design of the building. And fortunately enough, they agreed because they always want, also wanted to do a pilot project in this sense. From the former building I showed you, we had some steel trusses, steel beams, and because this was a temporary building as well, it had not been welded, but screwed together. So we were able to unscrew all this steel and to put it aside for a new construction. That's the intermediate storage of these beams. They have been checked by the engineer. Do they really carry the load which they are foreseen for? Are they safe? And then we had all this steel and we tried to do a design with it. How do we put them this way, the other way around, upside down, whatever. And we had about 10 or 15 different designs and decided which one was the best and most material efficient to build. On the opposite side of the street, we they were dismantling and destroying holes from the same industrial complex. And we saw these windows, they're aluminum frame, double glazed windows. And without thinking a lot, we went there, we collected the windows, we paid the workers a few money to get them down in one piece and to store it on our side of the road. We had not checked if we can really use them but we knew we wanted this as a remembrance, as a piece of identity of this former factory. We also found radiators, plenty, but all of the same size. So we said, okay, we will, go to, we will be going to find the solution. Let's store them. Let's try to use them because they are there. If we don't use them, they will be melted and then <coughs> reused in another form. But this destroys all the embedded energy. We didn't have enough windows with these big ones I showed you before. So we found another building which was being demolished and we tried to salvage the windows here. 
There were three glazed already, only four or five years old and already had to be dismantled. So we checked them, we cleaned them, measured them and stored them ready for use. By the way, I'm trying to establish a project at the moment to save all these windows which are destroyed in Switzerland to be brought to Ukraine later on, hopefully, because they're, they're also destroying windows for another reason, unfortunately. We were then looking for some metal sheets to cover the parts between windows, as we had already done it in the other house. Here we found red panels, not green ones, not blue ones. And we asked the authorities, is it okay for you if we just take the color which we have? And lucky enough, they said yes, because we made the calculation Let's say one square meter of these panels, aluminum panels painted is 35 francs per square meter, new. The salvaged material, all the costs added, we have to pay about 30, which is a little bit less than new material. And then we ask for a painter, how much would it cost to change the color? And he said, then the square meter would be 90 francs, three times the price of a new one. And there you see also the limits of uh, reuse and sal salvage material. If it comes in red, you use it in red. If it comes in green, you use it in green. If you try to change the color, forget about finances. So after one year, having spent 500,000 Swiss francs on material, we did the design of our house and the owners were happy because we had added a small corner here on the right side because the beams were longer than the house underneath. And we thought, why don't we just leave it? And we have a few square meters in addition to rent out. We had found three types of windows, these ones, here the big ones, which you have seen already. We found granite plates from a facade. We found the whole steel structure. We found uh, a whole um, staircase, which we added outside. We found the whole styrofoam construction for a roof. And we found this uh, or orange red metal cladding for the facade. We decided to leave the existing building, the outside. It's only 12 centimeters bricks and some steel frames, but it has a lot of embedded energy and it has, it has stood the test of time during 100 years. So I'm sure it can be there for another 100 years. And instead of producing a lot of waste by pulling it down and build up something else, even from salvage material, we decided to leave it. And it has contributed afterwards quite a lot towards um, improving our CO2 balance. These designs we presented also to the authorities and they were agreed that we could build it this way. We made a mock-up and I show this to you so that you can see exactly how it is constructed. If we start in the outside, we have this um, aluminum cladding. Then we have aluminum windows. These ones have, are three glazed, three, gla three layers of glass. Then we made a framework, which doesn't really need to be very strong because it the, the whole weight is going through metal pillars and not through the wood. And we decided to fill up the isolation with the straw. If you look from the other side, you see the straw, you see the metal sheets from the back. We found doors with the even upper lights 
and we found this granite floor, which were facade plates. We cut them into floor plates. And we tried, actually, we wanted to do a clay floor, which was unfortunately not possible because we didn't have the right tests and we didn't have time anymore to arrange for tests. But for the next building, we will try again and hopefully we'll succeed so that we don't even need concrete, but we can make the floor with a lost metal cladding, a lost metal scaffold and put on clay on top. We got their authorization and we started to put up the metal structure. And here you can see very well how it protrudes because the beams had this length and instead of cutting it, we just let it go out. We put up the three floors with this different uh, steel structure. And one detail is important here. We have had to fill these metal beams with concrete for fire prevention reasons. And another detail is here. This is where the structure is screwed together. And in order to be able, maybe later on, if you want to dismantle this structure again, we filled this only with some foam. So we could just take out the foam and reopen the screws because it's not enough to think to now use salvaged materials. You always also have to think on how in the future such a house can be dismantled and the parts be used again. I hope this will not be the case as long as I can see it, but you never know. We then used an old roof, an old metal roof with zinc sheets perfect for the, how do you call this in English? Where you put the concrete on, you put the concrete on the scaffolding or anyway, we put this on the beams and we filled the whole thing with concrete. As I said before, our plan was to use clay, but we were not allowed to. We then started to fix the windows and also to insulate with straw and some places with this um, stone wall, stone wool. And we added the red metal sheets. The whole of the staircase is put in front without, without any connection to the main house so that we can operate free and use tolerance if necessary. These um, facade plates from granite from Brazil, imported from Brazil by then, we were using it as a floor for this terrace. Something special, we tried to match the different sheets. We realized only when they were down from the other construction that they are not exactly the same. And so we decided to join them one on top of the other so that irregularities do not cause water to come in. And you can also see there is a small hole here and there, but this doesn't matter at all. It's not so nice, but who is seeing it from in the third floor, from the ground floor, when you look up at the building, nobody can see that. And nobody complained up to now. Inside, we had to use some concrete as well, some recycling concrete to, for the earthquake safety. And then we used again, this old steel construction to make it stiff in case uh, the ground would start shaking. And you see the combination also of the old walls. And then we just go in front of the old walls with this uh, earthquake security stuff, the stiffening. And we had to make a foundation down through the whole old building into the ground and make some micro foundations underneath. 
But with this device, we could actually solve all the problems of earthquake and of stability of the building. After closing the building, we started to build the inner walls and we finalized them with some wood plates, which are also salvaged from a concert uh, event. People who use this as a floor, we put it through the planing machine and the carpenter wasn't happy at all because there had been some nails which we had not seen and they destroyed his knives of the planing machine. So be careful. If you have to re to plane old timber, make sure there's no nail hidden. We don't see the straw anymore, but it's behind this clay wall for isolation. And you see also the dimension of the walls. It's almost the same dimension of a straw bale because you should not try and cut a straw bale. It will never end up good. Just take the same size of your wooden construction and then put the straw bales in and finish it off with clay. You can also see how we solved the problem of radiators. We had plenty, but as I said, the size all the same size, whereas the rooms have different sizes, so need different types of radiators. When we didn't have enough, or the engineer thought we didn't have enough, then we just put two, one on top of each other. In another house, Opposite the railway line, we found these floors and we put them on an insulation, which helps to prevent the acoustic for the people underneath. And that's how the room looks when it was finished. Now it's already rented out. We can't see it like this anymore. But you see again the two radiators, you see the windows with the triple glazing. And there's one detail I should explain to you. I said, these are the old windows. We just took them and we were lucky that they fit in. They were not too big. They didn't really fulfill the laws regarding insulation capacity. And that's why we decided to just put two and two glasses because they were free of charge. We just took enough. And then we put two here, two here. In the middle, we have some, some air. And with this, we is no problem to reach the values which are needed. You still see here the concrete as measurement to pre prevent from um, the, to prevent the building from collapsing in case of fire. And it wasn't necessary on all the beams as the engineer calculated. So we just did every other because it's also a factor of cost. The condition of the owner of the building was that uh, we can use as many salvaged items as long as it doesn't cost more than new, which is understandable. And of course, we had also a lot of issues regarding guarantees. Who would guarantee a window like that? It has four years, three glazed, as I said. But it's for me, the, the time is the guarantee. It has been there for four years. If the glass breaks, it's not a question of guarantee. The glass can break, it has to be replaced. But the window as such, if it has been doing its duty for four years, it will do another 40. And here we see again in more detail, the two by two and the space in between. Another use of this granite facade plates, very luxury toilets. And at the end, we even managed to find a solar system, uh, photovoltaic panels of secondhand use. It was more expensive and less effective than buying new ones, because in Switzerland, the 
salaries are so high. We pay for this guy, he has a salary, or we pay for him about 100 francs per hour. And if he has to lift up these panels and put them together in a system, he is not very current with it. It's more expensive than installing new ones. We were very lucky because the company itself wanted to know about the long-term condition of these panels and they're installing it here. Of course, they do produce electricity, but less than a new system, of course, but they want to see how fast the efficiency goes down over the years. So we were lucky that we could have a used solar system despite of the problems with these high Swiss salaries. So that's how it looks like at the end. We see also here that the panels are used. It's, uh, you can see the patina and it really doesn't look like a new building in the middle of all these old factory buildings. And if you are a good photographer and you wait for the nice sunlight, it really looks great, much better than with rain. So at the end, we also calculated what this exercise has brought. We were able to use 70% of reused construction elements and we saved this amount of resources and dumping volume, which we have not calculated a value to it. We saved over 50% CO2 as compared to new construction. This was calculated by experts, neutral experts, and it's absolutely revolutionary because with recycling concrete, for example, you can save 5%, maybe six or 7%, but never 50% of CO2. The SCR, the Swiss Architects, Engineers and Architects Association prescribes 30% uh, as a very, very good result. And we have reached 50. We also calculated that the 500 tons of CO2, which we saved, equal 60 years of operation of the building. So in, within 60 years, we can heat the building and we do not issue more CO2 to the world than if it was a new one. With these results, we were asked to do a third building for, as I said, this uh, Federal Institute of uh, Material Tests and Measuring. They have prepared a building which is ready to receive units of different, for different kinds of research. This, for example, is a research about urban mining. Then we have another one about digitalization. We have uh, solar panels here. We have methods of construction with concrete, using less concrete. And they asked us to fill in here in this floor, to fill in office spaces with reused materials. We had them prefabricated in the same factory I showed you, and then just brought up as cubes and put them into the floor as a whole element. That's how it looks from inside. We have a floor which needs to be covered. And we have the outer walls. We have these windows, which we still had from the other construction. So we were use, able to use them up, three glazed perfect windows. And this is how the whole row looks like when they were all mounted. We even used two of these big windows. Fortunately enough, they were not too big for the size of the, the, the room height. And this is how the offices look like. 
they wanted to have a separation between two offices, a corona um, able office, which afterwards they could take out these inner walls. And that's why we made it from carpet. There were squares of carpets and we folded them and added them together as a wall. And the good thing about this, that they measured the acoustics and they were happy with it. So it will be very easy once Corona is really over to take out the wall and to have a bigger office. Oops. Yeah, I wanted to show you the office without the middle wall, but it's empty, sorry. Yeah, so these are three projects we did as architects with special owners who were ready to take the risk and to go this way with us. And then we decided that the impact which we have is not enough. And we decided to make a spin-off from our architect's practice as planners for circular construction and reuse in the construction. And we want to advise other architects, planners, building owners, public building owners, universities, schools, and so on. Because if we are the only ones working in this way, we cannot advance fast enough. And this circular company is doing inventorization, 3D inventorization of existing buildings to see which we know they are going to be um, demolished. So we can see, is there anything we can use for another construction? And it has to be fast because nobody wants to pay for this, for this work. So the 3D scanners are a good solution. We are recommending to architects on how they could use um, used building material. For example, this is a Sorry, Barbara, uh, I think the microphone got covered again. Oh, sorry. Yep. Is it okay, okay now? Okay, it's good now. Yeah. yeah, it's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nope. so this is a power company, and we advise them to use their own masts, power masts, which they are dismantling thousands every year to make the building. Then we also developed ideas because uh, windows can be very tricky. And if the spare parts are not available anymore, people throw away the whole window instead of uh, replacing the spare part. And we tried to 3D print these spare parts, which works. We also work with the QR codes for logistic purposes. If somebody decides to dismantle a construction element, we give it a QR code and then you only measure it once, you only store it once, you always know where your part is. It's for logistic purposes, it's a very, very good tool. Okay, so that was a short of, sort of a marketing spot for Circular. And we hope that everybody is copying this idea because we have to be fast. We have to till 2030 to cut down our CO2 production, especially in the construction industry. Architects always want to know, but uh, this is a complicated way of construction. What are the additional costs? And I can tell you that from the honorary point of view, our work as architects was about 20% plus. And this 20% plus could be covered by CO2 certificates. Remember, we saved 500 tons of CO2. If we could sell a certificate for these 500 tons, we could cover this additional cost. We could also work with deposit fees because the material which is not dumped, it doesn't uh, fill up dumps. 
So, but which would have to pay fees. So if they don't have to pay fees, they could give us the fees, which we didn't manage to get yet. And we are absolutely convinced that the economy of scale can help to make things easier, that the materials are on a data bank, can be looked after, looked up. They have this QR code, they are inventorized. So all the architects would have access to that data bank and could choose their salvaged material to use it in their own works. Yeah, that's more or less a roundup, a quick roundup of what we have been developing during the last few years. And um, as you told, I'm now teaching also at ETH, and I'm very happy to talk to you, to the young architects, because you are not yet so into this normal way of art, doing architecture, building houses, building big uh, schemes. And I think my only hope is that you can still change and try with the reuse or with any other measures to reduce the CO2 production. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was an incredible talk. Um, I want to mention two things uh, for the audience. If you are here in the in the architecture school, you can just raise your hand if you have a question and we can pose it to Barbara. And if you are in the Zoom, uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature and you can uh, write your question um, there. Thank you again so much. I want, I'll quickly turn the, the computer so that you can see the students who are here and you can feel a bit more like your space. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can you see? Hi. <laughs> yes, I can see you. Okay, good. Um, okay, so we can start with a question. Um, questions not yet okay so oh yeah go ahead uh you can you can come up here and this is the best way if you just come here and and, and yeah <laughs> so a student will come will come up here and ask you a question okay great yeah. hey um i'm gabriel i think one of my questions was about that you mentioned connections in the structure and how you design them in a way that you can reuse them and adapt them again do you take that same approach in terms of fasteners for other parts of the project, like walls and like facades and all that? Uh, we are trying to develop all kinds of uh, solutions because what we do nowadays in, let's say 50 years ago, all the buildings were made in a way that you could dismantle them with keeping the, the materials intact. And only in the last, few decades, it came to um, that you cannot dismantle, you can only destroy. And I think we have to find hundreds of solutions with different materials, how to join them in a way that you can open it again. Even we always say you should screw, use screws instead of nails, but then if the screw is really rusted, then you don't open it either. So you have to not only to use screws, but to use inox screws, for example. And then the best thing is that all use the same type of screws, because if you have to change screwdriver five times, because all each screw is different, then you really get mad. I did uh, some experiments with my students and that's what we learned from these experiments. Does it Thank answer you. your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions coming up? Okay, um, I, I'll. Oops. Okay, I, I will have a, another question in the meantime. Um, it's a question about the design process, which you you talked a little bit, but I guess if you can. This, uh, talk more about how you imagine the design of a building or the rehabilitation or renovation of a building when the materials 
available are are not known and i guess do you imagine the work that you're doing with circular can kind of create an inventory and then once you have the inventory you know what is the building that you can design or what is the building that you can't design um which is very different from how architects normally think we draw whatever we want and then the, the materials will come regardless of of the of the of the availability somehow how do you how does that change how you design how you think about buildings and and all of that yeah i think we have to go back to the knowledge of our ancestors if you look at the old villages in in europe maybe then you have places where all the buildings are made from clay and timber in other places in southern italy they are all built from rocks and the people because the transport was more expensive and difficult, people just used what they found. And this is more or less the same approach. It's a sort of, uh, you are not free, as you said, you are not completely free to do what you want, but you have to adapt. It is an iterative, iterative process, yeah? You have an idea of the volume of what you want to build. Then you go and look for some material and you go from the big to the small. You go from the structure to the facade, to the cladding and you know, with time, you know already what is there. And I think this um, uh, circular and the big data bank we are trying to compose will really help other architects. Then they have a catalog of uh, construction material and they have their task they have they know their dimensions and then they can look it up and instead of putting money as a as an element you put co2 we add in this data bank we all we put each material we put a number of co2 kilos of co2 against the material so you know exactly at the end you can just add it up and say i've saved so much That's, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> to ask questions because it's so different, probably. <laughs> I, I I think many of the students actually are are working are working on a similar theme, so I I'm, I'm waiting for them to to come with the question. <laughs> but um, another question that that I can pose, uh, meanwhile, is um about modern buildings or your experience with modern buildings because somehow the the, the materials of, of a building built in 1900 or 1800 are are quite a bit different than if you think of a building from i just think of like a suburban uh, single family villa that is built today with a lot of wood and plastic and glue and adhesive and things like this do you also in your research have you found also that modern buildings con contemporary buildings have the possibility to be engaged with in this way, what problems do they present and what creativity is involved for that? Yeah, at the moment we are working with prefabricated concrete buildings, like uh, there were thousands in Eastern Germany and so, and we are trying to cut the single elements off again and then to compose them to use it again as a wall or as a floor and not just uh, crush it and re cycle the concrete because there you need almost as much cement as if it was new and uh, we do succeed we can do it but it has some restrictions of course but you can always adapt if your wall plate is not high enough you add a row of bricks or you add a window or whatever you have it is really stimulating your creativity you must really find solutions because you don't have enough material. What I'm doing with my students at the moment is we went for two weeks, we went to construction sites, to demolition sites, and they were allowed to take everything out, but they had to do it themselves. We gave them tools, we gave them help, but they had to choose. And they knew only that they're going to build a pavilion of about 100 square meters. And then we, after two weeks, we had all the material brought on site 
And then they had to start with three groups. One group was doing the floor, one group doing the walls, and one group doing the roof. And then they started to fight about the material because I said, we are on an ocean uh, ship and uh, you don't have, you have what you have. And with that, you have to work. And then the wall group said, no, but I need this and this. And the roof said, no, but I need the long ones. And it was really funny to see, but they managed. That's amazing. That sounds like an incredible student project. Um, that's very interesting. Yeah, Thank they you. are very, they are very, very happy. They are even working during holidays on it. And I haven't seen now <laughs> the result, but uh, I'm wondering next week, I'll see what they, what they really did now. <laughs> yeah, it will be interesting to see it. Yeah, um, send you a picture. yeah, yeah, please. Um, we have a question that came from the Zoom from a student, Marshall King. His question uh, is, your window reuse is really interesting. Do you have any thoughts on the uses for older windows that have little insulation value? Uh, there's a big, uh, big research going on. And there's a company in near us, two hours, but it's in Germany, but that doesn't matter. And this guy is a carpenter and also metal worker. And he has about 100 people now working for him. And he says he can upgrade any existing windows to the level which is necessary. Either you can change the glazing and put a double glazing instead of one single glass or you can add two windows, as I said, or you can change the frame, you can repair the frame. It's absolutely amazing what he can do. And it doesn't cost more than new windows, good ones, of course. You have windows from, uh, let's say, 500 Swiss francs per square meter up to 1,500. So it won't be 100 or 500, it will be more on the upper level, but you save the material, you save the energy, you don't fill the dumps. So it, from my point of view, it's really worth it. Yeah, that's amazing. That's interesting to think about the different uh, techniques and skills that are required to, to bring those materials into use today. Um, yeah. Fascinating. And the, the most important thing is also that the work stays in situ on place, you know? Right. If yeah. you import new windows, they can come from China, from anywhere. It involves a lot of transport, ways of transport and so on. But then if you rehabilitate, recondition the windows or remanufacture even, yeah. it stays on the place and it's a lot of know-how which is needed, but the, the know-how is there. It can be developed and it's a nice work rather than passing hours and hours of doing the same repetitive work on a machine. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, there's two questions from students who will, who will come, come to, the, to the front again. <laughs> okay. Be careful not, not to touch don't, this. Don't touch yeah, yeah, <laughs> because oh. <laughs> we have, we have a, a video system which is a bit... <laughs> Okay, okay, it's good again. Okay. Uh, yes, I won't, I won't even touch anything. Um, thank you, Hi. Barbara, for coming and giving a really inspiring and just great lecture overall. Um, I kind of have like a follow up to Gabriel's previous sort of question about like, you know, material informing the design. And almost like, you know, you'd started off the lecture with the Swiss are really good at recycling. And then you give all these examples of just people throwing stuff away. <laughs> um, like at what point does like you know economies of scale where the practice just becomes just getting material right um and like even just like having you becoming more of a middle person you had mentioned um you know reusing stuff from previous projects is there ever times where you're just getting stuff and you don't even have a project in mind you're just trying to find all this stuff and making sort of a collection Yes, of course, um, the, because it's painting to throw things away. And you see every day, everywhere you go, there are big construction sites and things are really being destroyed. But the problem is who pays for that? You know, I don't have money to just put things on a store and then wait for a year until it finds somebody who can use it. 
So I think the economy of scale is very important. If you or to have somebody behind, like a, a town council, who can say, "Okay, we own a hundred buildings, so let's analyze them and let's see before we destroy something, what can we use it for, or before we build something new, what can we use it for?" I think it's not on the level of the architect's practice. You can do that. It needs a much bigger frame. Otherwise, no, you can't pay for it. And the town council, they always have some land or some old hall which they could fill up. But it's a real problem. Yeah. And it depends on the cost of the material. As soon as the material costs more than the work, or at least more, let's say a little bit more and the work a little bit less, then it makes sense economically to save the material. And this, it was like this some uh, 50 years ago. People saved and they had big uh, dumps, not dumps, but uh, storage facilities outside and inside. And I know even a, a company in the US, which is called In Situ, and they are collecting and uh, keeping stuff which you can go and look for. The only thing which is missing is a data bank. Because if you have to go there in person, and then look through the doors or the windows, then it's getting really <laughs> a lot of work. But if you could have it on, a, on your computer and you see the, the doors and the windows with the sizes, and then you can order it by QR code, then I think it would get practicable. Let's say more practicable, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Hi, um, I actually had two questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, you talked a little bit about the solar panels earlier and how, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the company wanted to kind of test to the longevity of their solar panel. So you opted to reuse instead of going for a newer model. Um, and I'm just wondering what other scenarios you've had to kind of reconcile energy performance versus like a material reuse. Um, and what that process looks like, like how do you calculate which one's going to be better for the project in the moment? Yeah, you have to calculate it for every project because the conditions are always different. The, the main problem in Switzerland is, as I said, that the working costs are so high. A hundred francs for a man to stay there for one hour. How many panels can he take in his hand and fix them again? as opposed to a system which is comes prefabricated and he just has to put it up and it's much faster. So, and then you have also to calculate how much embedded energy there is in the solar panel and how much um, you would, it will still produce. That's another calculation, but it's not the, the financial calculation. The financial is always how much do I have to pay now and how much do I get out of it? But then the CO2 calculation is a bit broader. There you say, okay, this panel has used so many kilograms of CO2. And now if I have it, if it can work another 20 years, even only at 80% of the capacity, maybe, because this is what the company wants to know, how fast does it go down? And um, then it's another calculation to see, is it worth being up there? If the solar system stays on the roof where it was placed, it's definitely worth keeping it as long as it produces electricity. On the other side, the new panels, they produce double amount of electricity per square meter as the old ones, which are now 20 years old, the first ones. And so some people, when they have to take them down, they prefer to put up new ones, which gives you more power and which pays off better for the work, for the expensive work. So every, since every example is different and you have to make your calculation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna to go to the other ones before? A couple of uh, questions have come in the, in the Zoom questions. So uh, we have a question from, Another student here, Lai Chi Yang, who uh, asks, thank you for a lovely presentation, Barbara. I appreciate the statement you made on how the work 
doesn't look new in an old place? Have you found ways to capture or measure the social value and benefits of your reuse aesthetic? <laughs> it's a good question, yeah? Because um, in a, we have made the observation that in a new settlement, a new development, it takes about 20 years to really become alive. And in one of the pictures I showed you already in the beginning, it's an old uh, machine factory where we have our office. And there we really, we can't measure on uh, how the people appreciate to have still this old factory there with the old buildings. But you've seen the picture at night and we have um, about a thousand visitors a day in this factory. They go to the restaurant, they go to the bar, to the, to the theater, to the gym. And somebody told me once, I have moved to this area of town because of Gundeldinger Feld, because of this factory. And that's for me, one of the best thank yous I could get. Yeah, but to yeah. really measure, capture, yes, measure is very difficult. That's very interesting. That's right. It, nice to hear. Nice to hear about the social life that, that a project helps to create. Um, we have another question that came from the Zoom uh, from Linda Lee, who says, "Hello, amazing work. Thank you for sharing. I'm wondering if, in your cataloging and reuse practices so far, have you encountered instances where materials that were previously a standard?" make salvaging materials more difficult now. And they give the example of asbestos, which is a material that used to be very common here, but now it's toxic, considered the toxic material. Does that uh, fold into the CO2 calculations that you do or the different types of calculations? And how have you approached that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very <laughs> bad situation actually, because the first thing we have to do, for example, the before we go into this demolishing buildings with the students is really to check all the materials. And we have these experts who do the checking and they test if there is asbestos or no asbestos. And if there is anything toxic, if we just don't touch it, there's no way we could put the lives in danger. Yeah. And it's a pity sometimes because these things are fully functional, but if you take it out, that's, that's it. And we'll have to pay for the for the sins of the former generations of architects. Um, yeah, maybe maybe we can conclude with one more question that I have, which has to do with the the quality of the spaces that result from the work that you're doing, or the quality of of the the buildings, the, the qualities of the space. You mentioned in the beginning um, one building that now became a restaurant with a very high ceiling, but today no one would do that because it's too expensive. So somehow by going, reusing something from the past, you can achieve qualities that today are not really possible. Um, how do you think um, in, the, in the projects that you have done, do you see also that there are certain, I mean, it shows from the photographs that you, that you show, but how do you think about that? Or are you, how, how do you try to achieve it? Or what, are you, what is your thinking of that somehow the, the, the spaces that come out of this are not the typical kind of spaces that we would see in a normal building that they are a bit, um, have a different quality to them. Yeah, and I think people feel that. We never had problems to rent out the spaces. And we have done transformation of at least 10 of such factories in the meantime. And it has always been a good business also for the owner because there's less investment costs and the rent still is coming in. So the only problem we have is to how to insulate, how to heat these big holes, these big spaces. But uh, when you insulate properly and you heat down on the floor and then the heat goes up, then it's, you are more or less safe. Um, yeah, I think it's a big chance which we have. And also the chance is that 
you come into an old house and you see it immediately. You don't need renderings. You don't need big models. Yeah. You don't need uh, yeah. 3D constructions, but you can see it. It's there. And you can also, it furthers participation I see. of the stakeholders, you know? You yeah. can go there with all the people from the neighborhood and tell them, look, this is the place we have. What would you imagine here? I, they really... Um, furthers the fantasy and creativity because all the new buildings they look alike because yeah. for economical reasons it's really sad sometimes if you look at new constructions new settlements it's all the same and it's all the it's not ugly but it's no not exciting right, and right. you yeah. see these old spaces and these niches which you have and you can add another floor or you are just more free to express yourself. Yeah, that's really interesting. The, the the old buildings maybe offer more creativity than than to design a new one. That's very very love, um, yeah, yeah very provocative to, idea. Yeah, I would love to go to Detroit. I've seen pictures from Detroit of these old factories. The question there is: Are there enough people to really uh, yes. revive them? Or yes, it yes. must be a use for it, otherwise nobody puts a cent in, into such an old building. But yes, the buildings yes. there are great. Yeah, yeah. And, and speaking of that, I hope we can welcome you one day in, in Minneapolis or somewhere here in Minnesota. Uh, we also have a lot of um, historic Probably. structures that, that, that need such, such care and creativity. So. And yeah, I think uh, your, your lecture was just amazing, so insightful from information, know-how, technical things, conceptual, ecological, social, political, every dimension you covered. And that was um, so rich and, and inspiring. And I, I know that the students have also been inspired. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, <laughs> one more round of applause. <laughs>